LinkedIn presents. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Peter Anderton about the two rules of leadership and the three secrets of high-performing teams. Peter Anderton, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Great to be here, John. Thanks for having me on the show. It is fabulous to be with you today. You're joining us from the UK. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about leadership and high-performing teams, the characteristics of great leadership and three secrets of high-performing teams to be exact. As we get started, I wanted to share Peter's bio with everybody. Peter Anderton is an executive coach, leadership speaker, and masterclass facilitator. His TEDx talk, Great Leadership Comes Down to Only Two Rules, has been viewed well over 1.5 million times and is now being used in MBA programs around the world. He is also the founder of Internal Alignment, where he helps senior leaders who need their teams to go further and faster. He passionately believes leaders get the teams they deserve. And once they and their teams are at their best, pulling together and heading in the right direction, amazing things happen. I completely agree. I think that's amazing. Anything you would like to highlight, Peter, about your background, your personal context before we dive on in? We were discussing earlier, I'm very applied when it comes to leadership. One of the things that frustrates yeah. me is we've overcomplicated what leadership is all about. And I, I I don't believe leadership is easy. I don't believe that for a minute, but I do believe it's simple. And yeah. partly it's the engineering me. I've got an engineering background. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I look at things from an ap- applied perspective. How can we use this? How can How is this valuable to me? I'm not interested in stuff that's just knowledge for no for no reason or for no purpose. So it's a very applied approach. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And I'm all for, I like a good theory. I like a good typology. Uh, I think those things are helpful in terms of orientation. Uh, they're helpful to, you know, as we try to make sense of a messy world, as we try to self-reflect. Um, but if we never get past the theory, if if we never get to the applied where the rubber meets the road, uh, then we're really missing the boat, I think. And like you said, leadership is hard. It's hard work to do it well, but it's not rocket science. It's not complicated. Um, no, there are very not. simple things that if you do consistently over time will make all the difference in the world. And the reason it's so hard is the consistency piece. Like people yeah, just are not good at consistently doing these basic things that we talk about over and over and over again. And, you know, in order to sell books and to sell, you know, and to be, to be high paid consultants, sometimes people will try to make it way more complicated than that than it is. And they'll try to say, buy my thing. I'm going to teach you, you know, everything you need to do. Um, the reality is it's, it's, it really, when you boil it down to the most basic elements, it's just about doing some simple things consistently over time. I think that's really key. And I think, um, if you like, what I focus on is the mindset of leadership, because there's a mm-hmm. lot of people out there thinking, Oh, I need this new tool. I need this new technique, this new model. It will solve all my problems. Uh, and uh, and of course, that's not that's not the case at all. Actually, yeah. what we need to recognize is that leadership isn't about the next tool or technique or idea or concept. It, it's about what you do with it. It comes down to these small things applied on a day to day basis. And the analogy I would give is it's a bit like your phone. I don't know if your phone's anything like mine, John, but I've got. I'm terrible at downloading apps thinking, oh, that'd be interesting. And then I never use it. And then I've got, I've got apps on my phone that I do use on a regular yeah. basis. 
uh, and I've got apps that I've downloaded, but never ever it never ever opened. And yeah. we can be collecting things like leadership, like apps on our phones. And what I'm interested in right now is the operating system of leadership. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter how many apps you download. If your operating system's clunky and it's not working, then, it, then everything starts to fall over. If you get the operating system of leadership right, the mindset of leadership right, the rest of it just works. Of course, there are tools and techniques that are useful. But unless you actually get the mindset right, it's just window dressing. And, and, and I guess that's what yeah. I'm about. Yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't matter how good the tool is if you don't use it, like you said. So it could be the most amazing revolutionary app ever, but if it's just sitting on your phone and you don't know how to use it um, in a meaningful way, then it's worthless. And same thing with a lot of the tools. There, There are lots of really great methodologies, typologies, theories, tools, uh, models, that are are really cool and like quite helpful, but you get so inundated by them that you just start to add. And, you know, I often think about the need to prune back and to simplify, not because these things aren't helpful or useful potentially, but because you just simply cannot function Mm. when you have just all this stuff around you constantly. So simplifying to the point where you're getting down to basics and finding, you know, some tools that you want to use, but making sure that they're ones that you actually use. Uh, And then, like you said, focus on the operating system, focus on the basics, Um, do those consistently. That'll make all the difference in the world. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more, John. Well, before we talk and get into the three secrets of high-performing teams, maybe we could lay the groundwork based on your TED Talk. What are those two rules of great leadership that you focus on well the foundation for rule leadership is is rule number one of leadership there's no surprises there and the first thing that any leader needs to truly understand is that it's not about them Mm -hmm. Uh, too often we find that you know we're, we're focused on our own our way of doing things our solutions what we want how we want things to be done and our egos will so often get in the way and and we we put a lot of pressure on ourselves because we feel like it's our responsibility to deliver the result. The mindset shift with true leadership, and this is where rule number one really kicks in, is that it's not your job to deliver the result. It's your job to deliver the team who deliver the result. Mm. And it sounds like semantics, but there is a universe of difference between those two approaches. And when you own that as a leader, everything starts to shift. And the interesting thing is, if you just if all you have to do is think back to people that you've worked for in the past, the bad ones and the good ones. And and sadly, nobody likes to work for a bad boss, but we usually will learn more about leadership from a bad boss than we do from a good boss. But it doesn't matter which you look at. If you were to write a list of all the different things that they both did. okay. I mean, we can do some of that now, if you like, John. Think about worst boss you ever had. give, Give me three or four things that they did. Uh, just a bully, a jerk, a narcissist. Um, like you said, they make it all about themselves. Okay. Take, so you they can, take it out on others. Yeah. Yeah. And you you can see that all the way through. And it doesn't matter whether we say they don't listen, they criticize, they, they took all the, the, all the praise. The whole point is they put the focus of the attention on them. Now you think about the best ones you ever worked for. And the question is, where is the focus of their attention? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's it's absolutely the opposite. They're more servant leadership minded. You know, they're uh, they're they're really geared towards. It, it's subtle oftentimes, and that's I, I agree with your point about sometimes you learn more from the bad leader because mm. with the good leader, it's subtle. Um, it's not in your face. They're not like constantly shining the light on them, saying, "Look how amazing I am as a great leader. Pay attention to me and look at my example." It's just subtle and it's consistent, uh, and so you have to kind of be paying attention to it. Otherwise, you might miss it. Yeah. Well, there's quite a challenge. I mean, Lao Tzu, uh, obviously, there's there's loads of fantastic stuff out there from him. But I think his take on leadership is not so well known. Uh, and, and what he said, the, the, the leader is best so that when their work is done, the people say we did it ourselves. Yeah. Yep. So uh, so the, it's not a case of, oh, look what this great leader has achieved. The people think, well, we did that. And and again, the problem with that then is we like to look like we're the superhero. <laughs> it, it appeals to all of our egos. It's part of the human condition. But as you say, to watch the best boss, well, that's a lot more subtle. It's not as obvious. There aren't neon flashing lights around them saying, oh, my goodness, look at that person and the way that they lead. It's phenomenal. 
but you'll notice the bad one very easily. <laughs> the good ones are harder to spot. And I've, I've even had conversations <laughs> with senior people who've been asking me the question. So how do I balance this then with my reputation in the organization? And he, he recounted a time when somebody had even said to him, look, I don't really know what you do, but your people, your team are fantastic. <laughs> Uh, and and it's a you know to think that somebody could actually say that and not join the dots and recognize that that's exactly <laughs> the point you know that's what i do uh, and i think i think that's really really key so that's that's the foundation that's rule number one of leadership everything begins there yeah and can i can i also just reiterate what you're just saying because it's subtle um so because not only will members of your team not always notice the subtleties and what's happening but sometimes, you know, within your organization, they might see the performance of your team and think, oh, that's fantastic. But they don't necessarily see you and what you're doing and the work you're putting in behind the scenes uh, and the consistency that you're doing over time to, to get the team to where they perform at a high level. Uh, and I've seen examples where that that actually really can hurt uh, the leader, you know, from an internal mobility standpoint, from an internal politics standpoint, potentially, if they're not trying to, you know, lead across and lead up at the same time. Um, so that's a hard, that's a hard thing uh, to balance is making sure that you're helping, um, you know, be, being a servant leader that's focused on your people, giving them the credit, letting, creating the environment where they can do awesome stuff. Uh, but then at the same time, you know, you don't want people to just assume you're not doing anything because you just happen to have a great team that's amazing and they're carrying you as the leader. And, and that's why I think we get into so many toxic environments and why so many leaders are so bad is because they're chasing, you know, the, the gold star from the people above them. They're, they're trying to set themselves apart so that they can get promoted to the next level or move up in their career. Um, and they see that the only way to do that is for them you know, to take all the credit, to to make it all about them and to constantly shine the light on them. Uh, any thoughts on how we make that balance? Yeah, absolutely, because because it is a challenge. And I think the, the danger is, you mentioned in the bio, that I, I passionately believe every leader gets the team they deserve. So if the leader of the organization is behaving in that way, that's how other leaders will behave. And that's, you know, that's effectively what will what will start to rise to the top. It's not it's not easy. This comes back to what we said before about leadership. But what I, what I would recognize is when it comes to leading people, it's too easy to think that we're only leading down through the organization. All the principles that we would apply for great leadership as we develop and grow our team apply to the levels below yep. above us. Uh, and I think because people say, well, what's the secret to managing upwards? Well, I'd say the same as managing downwards, really. <laughs> we just obviously there's a nuance there that you're thinking about how you're doing it. But but if you rely on the fact that you are the manager to influence other people, you've already lost. Yeah, yeah. So you're already, all you're going to get at that point is minimum compliance. I mm -hmm. once spoke at an event in the UK in the Houses of Parliament, and there was a, a politician that was opening the event up. And, and he'd come in, he'd, he'd been out on the lash the night before because they'd just won some sort of by-election. So he was a little bit worse for wear. And he gave <laughs> a pretty pretty poor speech at the, to, to open the session. And one of the things he said, and I, I'm sitting here thinking, is this is this for real? He actually said, <laughs> it's all right for you because we, when we're doing these things, we have to work with volunteers. We're working with all these different political parties and you know, volunteers are helping us you know, get the votes in and canvas and uh, so on and so forth. He says, for you, you just ask people to do stuff and it happens. And I'm, I've almost got my head in my hands at this point thinking, is that really how you think it works? Because the danger we've got, of course, is when when people work for us because they have to, well, all they do is what they have to do. And if we look at our teams and people just do what has to be done and nothing else, well, quite frankly, in today's world, we're done for. We 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 can't get by in most organizations without people going above and beyond. And if they're just doing the bare minimum, that's all you get from uh you know what comes from being the manager, having the job title. So I I would really argue that, that the core principles are the same whether you're managing up or managing down. You've got to use all, all the same stuff. And that's why, you know, you, you could argue then it's doubly important to yeah. get it right. 
Yeah. Well, and, and the, the compliance versus commitment mentality that you foster within your team, right? I see that Absolutely. all the time. It's a huge problem in a lot of teams and a lot of leadership approaches. Um, too many leaders focus on the fear-based carrot and stick tactics. Uh, that's it's, 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 that might get you compliance and it might get you some performance in the short term, but it's not going to get you long-term loyalty, commitment, and engagement. That's going to be what's going to produce all the great stuff, right? For your team. Uh, and all you're going to do at that point is, you know, you might be the superhero, but all you're going to do is create a team who are just reliant upon you, almost yeah. like little ba- baby chicks waiting for the next drop of wisdom or instruction to come. Uh, and what you really want is to create a team, a team of leaders. And I don't mean, oh, they're going to be the next chief exec. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, a team of people who own what they're doing. Yeah. So that when something goes wrong, they want to fix it. They don't just pass it up the chain saying, not my problem. Here's one for you. They're owning it. They're making it happen. They're leading whatever it is that they're trying to take forward. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what's your second of the two rules of leadership? Well, well, it, it follows on nicely from what we were just saying about sort of um, um, compliance versus commitment. I'm a big fan of John Maxwell's five levels of leadership. And you know, just just for anybody that's new to it, I'll just I'll go through it very very briefly now. But you know, level one leadership is where people follow you because you know, they work for you because they have to, and that's where you get the minimum commitment. You know, people do what they have to do. Level two leadership is where they follow you because they like you. Now, again, I'm not suggesting you have to be their best buddy. That's not I'm not saying that at all. But we've all worked for somebody we liked, and we've all worked for somebody we didn't like. You give more when there's a relationship. And what happens here at level two leadership, there's a deeper level of commitment. So you're going from compliance into a deeper level of commitment and you can go deeper and deeper and deeper. Level three leadership is where they follow you because you deliver. You've made things happen. Things are better because you were there. You follow through on your commitments. Level four leadership is where they follow you uh, because you've you've actually helped them grow. And for all of us, we can think back to the people we've worked for in the past that have shaped us and helped us become the person we are today, which won't always have been comfortable, by the way. This isn't about being yeah. nice. Sometimes that's quite challenging. Sometimes that's quite stretching. But they've got your back. And even if they push you forward for things that you perhaps you think you're not capable of, they're there to support you and, and to cheer you on. Uh, but it's not always easy and by any stretch of the imagination. But level four leadership is where you're getting to a real deep level of commitment from your team because they realize how you've helped them grow. And then level five leadership is the ultimate where people will work for you with blood, sweat and tears because they follow you because of who you are and what you stand for. Yeah, and there's, uh, and of course, you know, there's a real awakening today in today's world that it's about, you know, do I buy into the purpose of this organization, of this leader? Do I believe in who they are as a person? Can mm-hmm. I respect and trust them? Because, uh, and actually, if those things are all yes, then people are prepared to give everything because mm-hmm. they believe in the person and they believe in what they stand for. And that's the deepest level of commitment, which brings us face to face with rule number two, because if rule number one says it's not about you, it's not about, it's not about your ego. It's not about your way of doing things. It's not about your solutions. Uh, and, you know, Ella Roosevelt put that really nicely. She said, um, a, a good leader inspires people to be confident in the leader, but a great leader inspires people to be confident in themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's not about rule number one, but that's, that's what rule number one covers. Well, rule number two, then building on what we've just said here, rule number two says, well, it's only about you, which, which confuses some people initially. But the point I'm saying here is that people are following you because of who you are and what you stand for. And and how you behave is 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 absolutely critical. It's the foundation of all things. And the thing to recognize is if we want a deeper level of commitment from somebody, we can't press a button and say, well, hey, John, I'd like a bit more commitment from you. Thank you very much. We have to change our behavior Mm -hmm. to instigate that shift. So whatever we want from our team, you know, whenever we find ourselves looking at our team and and we're disappointed with what we see, this goes back to what I said a bit before about in time. You know, we've all inherited teams. I get that. We have to yeah. knock them into shape at times. But every leader gets the team they deserve. You know, if we're looking in the mirror and asking ourselves the question, why am I team like this? The answer is staring us in the face. We have to change our behavior in order to get a shift in theirs. And Nelson Mandela, I mean, he put this beautifully. He said, I could not change others until I changed myself. 
uh, and, and genuinely absolutely everything that you need to know about leadership is one of these two rules everything mm. else is just noise yeah well and i and i can't help but think of uh the show ted lasso so i don't know if you're a fan of that show if you've watched it i just completed the the third season and the finality no spoilers here uh for anyone who's who's uh, uh part of the audience who hasn't uh, caught up yet um but what an incredible show so many great leadership lessons and when i think about um what makes Ted Lasso, who is someone who doesn't know anything about uh, soccer, uh, what makes him capable of coming in and turning around this complete mess of a franchise and a team um, to make it, you know, into something really great and special. It comes back to, to exactly what you just described in terms of those two leadership rules. Um, and it makes for something really quite special and amazing. Uh, and it, it's special and amazing because we don't see it all that often because it's hard to do it consistently. Yeah. And it requires, it requires you to have a lot more, I don't know, self-assurance and maturity and self-awareness, you know, as a leader, um, then, you know, then I think a lot of people are used to, uh, anyways, it, it just, it, it's, it's hard, especially when you, when you, uh, when you move into a role where the team is set and you're working with the people that are there, how do you make those shifts over time? There will be some transitions. You, some people might move in or out, um, but ultimately who you have is who you have. So how are you going to change the environment within uh, that group of people to accomplish something great? I know it's a fictional story, but the, the show Ted well, Lasso is just a really great, a really great it, illustration. It, 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 <laughs> It's a shame that something like that is fictional, really, isn't yeah. it? Because I think you're yeah. right. There's some powerful lessons that come from it. I, I, absolutely. And, and, and interesting enough, the um, if you take and I'm I'm not a football expert or so- soccer as you call it over there, <laughs> but uh, you know, so um, Sir Alex Ferguson's been studied by people as you know some of the ultimate in leadership, as he was the manager of uh, of Manchester United. Um, the the and there were some fabulous lessons that could be learned from it. He knew everybody's name. OK, you know, right, right down to the, you know, whoever was cleaning the kit or whatever. So, so then, you know, there's, there's a parallel you can see there. Uh, he he would treat the players differently, not through being having favourites, but recognising that different players needed different approaches to get the best result from. So there's lots that could be learned from him. However, the challenge I have is that as soon as he left Manchester United, things really started to go downhill in terms of their performance. Yeah. And what that means then to me is too much depended on him, which is the mistake of, yeah. you know, that's where you trip over rule number one. Like I said, I'm not going to put myself forward as a soccer uh, or a football <laughs> expert here, but I do think, you know, if, if a leader steps away from an organization and things go backwards, sometimes people think, oh, you know, that, that leader was indispensable. No, the leader's job is to deliver the team. And they need to be able to, to to develop that team to the point that they can step away and things actually function, you know, better you know, as well as and in time, if not better, without them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that means building your bench strength. That means uh, in the coaching world. That means you, your uh, who are your assistant coaches? Who are who are those other people um, as part of your staff? Are you preparing them to take on? you know, these sorts of roles in the future. So if you ever leave, someone else is ready to step in and pick up the mantle, right? Um, you know, that's that's the kind of mentality that we're talking about. And it, and it applies into any organization. All right, let's take the remainder of our time now and talk more specifically about the, these three secrets. And I, and I know it relates back to these two rules, and we've been talking about teams the entire time. Um, but what are the, those three secrets of high-performing teams that you um, talk about? So, the, 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 it, again, it's very simple, uh, but, but very, very important. The, the, the three things that you need in any high-performance team are connection, potential, and reason. So I'll talk about CPR for teams. And um, I don't know if that translate in the US, uh, mm-hmm. the same, yeah. okay, same, same principle. And uh, let's take potential then, first of all. You, you need, obviously, whatever it is you're trying to achieve, you need a certain set of skills and experience. You need, you need real diversity, different perspectives, different takes. All of this stuff needs to be brought together. Uh, and that's got to be in place. Then you need connection. 
and, and if we take an example using sports then, so take a national soccer team, you might have a team packed full of stars. Okay. However, if they can't actually connect and learn to work together, well, they'll, they'll consistently be beaten by a lesser side. So the way in which they connect, the way in which they come together uh, is, is, is fundamental to their success. And then the third thing you need is reason. You know, I need to know what is the goal? Where where am I aiming? You know, why should I get out of bed in the morning? Why should I care about whatever it is we're trying to achieve? And if you've got those three things in place, then teams can really start to work. And, you know, whether it's connection, uh, Henry Ford famously said, you know, get everybody uh, working together and success takes care of itself. You know, there's an element of if you can create that combination. Uh, but if you can get to the point that people are, are, at their best, using their mutual strengths. You know, I was just having a coaching conversation with somebody earlier about a, a business partner where they're, they're totally opposite and that's causing them some frustration, but she's also valuing the fact that mm-hmm. the fact that they're total opposites means they've got all the bases covered between them as business partners and that works really, really well. So, so working with each other's mutual strengths. And then finally, again, having that absolute clarity, what is it we're trying to achieve why should anybody care? And how will we know when we've arrived? Those are yeah. the three. There's lots we could say about them, but at a high level, that, that's how I'd introduce them and position them. Yeah, I really like that. And sorry to to share another sports um, connection here. Uh, I, I don't know if other, other parts of the world, if if the term the dream team resonates or or means anything to you, but uh, in in the basketball world, uh, you may recall that back in the the nineties, I'm trying to remember ninety two maybe Olympics, um, the U.S. fielded its first what we called the dream team in basketball: Jordan, Bird, all all the great you know all stars, all time great NBA players, and they just dominated. You know, they went out and win it, win it every game by fifty points. They win the gold medal, right? They set the expectation super high, and so you know each uh, following Olympics, you know there, we'd field a new team of these. Um, these NBA all-star, you know, Olympians who would go out and they would do very well and they'd end up winning the gold medal. Um, fast forward now, and I, I don't remember which year exactly. It might've been like some, somewhere in the 2000s, 2004, 2008, something like that, um, that we fielded a team and they did not win the gold. Uh, in fact, I think they barely won the bronze and, uh, you know, people are like, what is going on? It's just stacked. This whole team is stacked with so much talent, so much capability, what is going on? And why can't these uh, players, you know, perform at the level that these previous dream teams performed at? And it all comes back to exactly what you just described in terms of those three secrets of high-performing teams. And ultimately you had a bunch of people. It was all about them. Uh, It was all about, you know, them being the best person on the team. They were the top talent. They never played as a team. They never had a connection. Uh, They didn't have a good balance of, of skill sets And it showed like, so as soon as they started playing against other national teams and uh, Olympians from other countries who had been playing with each other for a long time, who had chemistry and camaraderie and, and knew each other's strengths and how to leverage them, you know, they were toast. Uh, And it, it was a good lesson. Like talent doesn't always win the, the gold, right? Like you have to have good, you, you want talent, you want skill, you want ability and capability, but you actually need people to be able to work together. And that's, that's a deficiency of, you know, not just the players in that instance, but the coach, right? And so the leader of the team has to create that environment where people can come together and work together in effective ways. It's really key. And I describe connection as the messy bit in the middle. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it's it's definitely the piece that makes a team or breaks a team. When you get that connection, you know, and, and it's based on trust, it's based on creating an environment where, where actually um, people will say what they really think in the conversation, not afterwards with somebody else. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it, it's said there in the room, you know, or, or on the pitch or whatever it is. Because uh, uh, too often in teams, you know, the, the real conversations happen in little huddles here, there, and after. Yeah. And that's like a cancer that eats away at a team. You need a team who trusts one another and a team who speak openly and honestly with it, with you, that with it. Can't get my words out with each other. You know, obviously, <laughs> respectfully and professionally, yeah. but it needs to all be there on the table. And if you haven't got that in place, 
then actually a lot of things start to fall away from the performance of the team. It, it, it absolutely, I would say that's that that's the part in the middle that makes it or breaks it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Peter, this has just been fascinating. I know at the time I need to let you go. I think I'm already holding you a little bit over, um, but it, it it really does come back to some of these simple principles. Now, is there a whole lot more we could talk about? Absolutely. We could talk about this all day long, talk about all sorts of additional points and examples, et cetera. Uh, but I think this is a really great um, start. And and I think if if members of the audience today do nothing else than just start to self-reflect upon and and think of ways to just do a couple simple things and start to implement some of the things we were talking about and just do it consistently over the next month. I think you'll just start to see huge improvements. Um, and then you can start to get into the nitty, nitty gritty of some of the other uh, elements over time. Uh, Peter, again, a pleasure. Before we wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Brilliant. Okay, no, that's great. So in terms of connecting with me, um, my website is uh, is peteramberton.com. So that's an easy one to remember. But also another thing that you might find interesting is that as a if you go to www.theinspirometer.com and uh, I know you'll put the text uh, in, in with the information, uh, you'll find a three minute leadership assessment. So they'll give you an opportunity to you know take the test, work out how you compare in terms of how inspirational a leader you are and how inspired you are. Uh, and that also comes a, a lot of useful information that comes through with that, that if you want to take that up to the next level, how to take that approach. So so I would say that's a really, really good place to start. And what's interesting about the Inspirometer is it overlays the two rules of leadership with the three secrets of every high performing team. So you end up with six core elements that you really want to drive and move forwards if you want to be the best leader you can possibly be. So www.theinspirometer.com. It'll just take you three minutes. So uh, I'd, I'd have a go at that. That's a, that's a, that's a great way because then you can get onto my mailing list and we can have, have further conversations following on from that. So that's what I'd recommend. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn and I regularly post information on, on LinkedIn. So you'll find me as Peter Anderton. I'm director of the company Internal Alignment. So that would be the thing to do for connection there. Final word for me would be what we've talked about today. I mean, we, we've we've sort of scraped the surface really. That It's the lens that I would recommend you use to deal with any leadership challenge, any team problem that you've got. Ask yourself, how does this? How do I apply rule number one to this scenario that I'm dealing with? How do I apply rule number two? And just bring it down to those two key levels and make sure that you're operating on, on, on that basis. But also, it's you know, connection, potential, and reason are a really neat way of looking at this. I've got this challenge. How can I look at it from a connection perspective? How can I look at it from a potential perspective? How can I look at it from a reason perspective? And what ideas and insights come through from using these two lenses, you know, the two rules and the three secrets of every high performing team? Usually we can answer so many of our own dilemmas by bringing yeah. this lens to it. But probably my, my final word would be to recognize, and this goes back to what you said right at the outset, John, which I thought was brilliant. Your leadership is about small things. You know, too, too often people think it's about it's about the big vision and the strategy, and it, actually, it's about small day to day stuff that's carried out consistently that makes the biggest difference. And there is no such thing as the perfect leader. That person simply does not mm. exist. But the next best thing is the one who gets and consistently applies as best they can rule number one and rule number two. That's where it all comes together. Thank you, John. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Peter. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Peter can do for you. Check out the assessment, check out his website. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.